part one chapters one through five of out of the shadow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major out of the shadow by rose cohen part one chapter one i was born in a small russian village our home was a log house covered with a straw roof the front part of the house overlooked a large clear lake and the back open fields the first time i became aware of my existence was on a cold winter night my father and i were sitting on top of our red brick oven the wind whistling through the chimney and rattling the ice-covered windows frightened me and so i pressed close to my father and held his hand tightly he was looking across the room where mother's bed stood curtained off with white sheets every now and then i heard a moan coming from the bed and each time i felt father's hand tremble appearing and disappearing behind the bed curtains i saw my little old great aunt in a red quilted petticoat and white close-fitting cap whenever she appeared and caught father's eye she smiled to him a sweet crooked smile finally i recall hearing a few sound slaps followed by a baby's cry and aunt calling out loudly it's a girl again about three years passed with my little sister as companion i recall many happy days we spent together in the summer we picked field mushrooms at the back of the house or played near the lake and watched the women bleaching their linens i was happiest in the morning when i first went out of doors to see the sunshine the blue sky and the green fields filled my soul with unspeakable happiness at such moments i would run away from my little sister hide myself in a favoured bush and sit for a while listening to the singing of the birds and the rustling of the leaves then i would jump up and skip about like a young pony and shout out for pure joy in the winter we cut and made doll's clothing father was a tailor and as soon as we were able to hold a needle we were taught to sew mother taught us how to spin grandfather made toys out of wood for us and grandmother told us stories these were the pleasant days during the winter but there were others days that were cold and dark and dreary when we children had to stay a great part of the time on top of the oven and no one came not even a beggar but when a beggar did come our joy was boundless i remember that grandfather would hasten to meet the poor man as we called him at the door with a hearty handshake and a welcoming smile saying peace be with you brother take off your knapsack and stay overnight mother would put on a fresh apron and begin to prepare something extra for supper and grandmother who was blind and always sat in bed knitting a stocking would stop for a moment at the sound of the stranger's voice to smooth the comforter on her bed her pale face so indifferent a minute before would light up as if with new life while we children fearing if seen idle to be rebuked and sent into a distant corner from where we could neither see nor hear the stranger would suddenly find a dozen things to do on such a night after supper there was something of a holiday spirit in our home we would light the lamp instead of a candle and place it on a milk jug in the centre of the table then we all sat around it grandmother with her knitting mother with her sewing all of us listening eagerly to the stories the stranger told but more surprised than even any of us children about the wonderful things going on in the world was grandfather he would sit listening with his lips partly open and his eyes large with wonder every now and then he would call out ach brother i never would have even dreamt such things were possible at bedtime grandfather would give up his favourite bed the bench near the oven to the stranger mother would give him the largest and softest of her pillows and grandmother would give him a clean pair of socks to put on in the morning the next day after he was gone we felt as after a pleasant holiday when we had to put on our old clothes and turn in to do the everyday things yes i recall happy days and sad days days of sorrow which then were very real across the road from our home about a quarter of a block to the left was a cemetery over each grave stood a wooden cross and about the middle of each one there were tied little aprons of red green and yellow material on windy days i loved to watch these fluttering in the wind and whenever i looked through half-closed eyes they took form and became like coloured birds hovering over the graves one windy day at dusk i went out to the middle of the road to watch the little aprons flying in the breeze and saw something red lying on the road near the cemetery 
i guessed it to be an apron blown away by the wind how beautiful my doll would look in one of these thought i but how could i get it i was in mortal fear of the cemetery although mother had often pointed out how peacefully the dead slept and had said that she wished the living were as little to be feared i never went near them but now i wanted the little red apron for my doll the longer i looked at it the more i wanted it finally i decided to risk getting it slowly step by step i walked toward it keeping my eyes on the graves and repeating softly to myself to keep up courage there is nothing to fear there is nothing to fear until i reached it when i had it in my hand i stood still for a moment the very thought of turning my back on the dead made my hair stand on end i walked backwards a few steps suddenly i turned and ran as i ran i felt my heart beating violently against my ribs my feet were as heavy as lead and the distance to the house seemed endless but i ran fast so fast that when i reached the door i could not stop i fell against it it flew open and i fell headlong into the house mother came running over to pick me up when i regained my breath i told her what had happened and showed her the little apron which i still held in my hand as usual sister who wanted everything she saw and to whom i was made to give in because she was younger came over and asked for it and as usual i refused she tried to snatch it from my hand but i pushed her away she fell and struck her head against the bench then father came over with a strap and told us to kiss each other or we should be spanked mother looked at me with tears in her eyes knowing no doubt what would happen and she left the room grandmother called to me to hide behind her back but i would not do that my sister looked at me then at the strap and came over to kiss me but i could not at such moments neither would i let her kiss me so i was spanked and the little apron was taken away from me and given to her chapter two when i was about eleven years old there were five of us children one day father went to town and came back with a stranger who we were told would teach us to read and write our teacher was a young man of middle height thin dark and pale he had an agreeable voice and when he sang it was pleasant to hear him when we did our lessons well his eyes brightened and his tightly closed lips would relax a little but when we did poorly he was angry and would scold us as soon as i learned how to read i would sit for hours and read to my grandmother besides the bible we had a few religious books i read these again and again and became very devout i read the morning noon and evening prayers and sometimes i fasted for half a day then i became less stubborn and the quarrels between sister and myself became less frequent one day father left home on a three days journey when he returned he did not look like himself his face was pale and he seemed to be restless during the three days that followed father went out only at night i also noticed that mother collected all of father's clothes and as she sat mending them i often saw her tears fall on her work on the third night i awoke and saw father bending over me he wore his heavy overcoat his hat was pulled well over his forehead and a knapsack was strapped across his shoulders before i had time to say a word he kissed me and went to grandmother's bed and woke her up i'm going away mother she sat up rubbed her eyes and asked in a sleepy voice where to america father whispered hoarsely for a moment there was silence then grandmother uttered a cry that chilled my blood my mother who sat in a corner weeping went to her and tried to quiet her the noise woke grandfather and the children we all gathered around grandmother's bed and i heard father explaining the reason for his going he said that he could not get a passport for a reason i could not understand at the time and as no one may live in russia even a week without a passport he had to leave immediately his explanation did not comfort grandmother she still sat crying and wringing her hands after embracing us all father ran out of the house and grandfather ran after him into the snow with his bare feet when he returned he sat down and cried like a little child i spent the rest of the night in prayer for a safe journey for my father chapter three as father's departure to america had to be kept secret until he was safe out of russia 
we had to bury our sorrow deep in our own hearts and go about our work as if nothing unusual had happened mother and i sat at the window sewing and grandfather found relief in chopping wood all day long his axe flashed in the sun and ships flew far and near and even grandmother's tears which were always ready were kept back now as she sat on her bed knitting a stocking and rocking the cradle with one foot while sister seemed to be everywhere at once it was then and for the first time that i realized something of her real worth those soft grey eyes of hers seemed to see every one's needs when grandmother put her feet down on the floor and felt about for her slippers it was sister who would find them and stick them on her toes the same little woman of eight kept a little brother of five and a sister of two playing quietly in a corner and even when they were hungry she would not let them disturb mother but would cut some thick slices of black bread dip them into water sprinkle them with salt and taking a bite of her slice she would close her eyes and say mmm what delicious cake in the evening after supper when grandfather would sit down near the stove staring sadly into the fire she would climb up on his knee and plait his long grey beard into braids soothed by her gentle touches and childish prattle he would fall asleep and forget his troubles for a while chapter four so the days passed one morning mother went to the post office and when she came back she looked as if she had suddenly aged she took a postal card from her pocket and we all bent our heads over it and read i have been arrested while crossing the border and i am on my way home walking the greater part of the way if we pass through our village i shall ask the officer to let me stop home for a few minutes be brave and trust in god at the news more tears were shed in our house than on the day of atonement that night after the doors were barred and the windows darkened grandmother grandfather and mother with a three weeks old baby in her arms sat in the niche of our old chimney making plans to defeat the czar of russia the next day mother sent grandfather away on a visit he was not a person to have around in case of trouble for the very sight of brass buttons put him into such fright and confusion that he would forget his own name after he was gone mother went to town to see her brother and arrange for the escape then there was nothing left to do but wait for father's homecoming i remember that i used to run out on the road many times a day to see if he were coming one afternoon we were all startled at hearing someone stamping the snow off her feet at our door i ran to the window and looked out it was only yana a woman known in our village to be very clever and religious but unkind i wondered at her coming for i knew that she and mother were not on friendly terms she came into the house and walking straight over to mother who was bending over the cradle she said in her usual voice which was like a drake's soft and hoarse your husband is arrested i just saw him on the road mother became so pale and looked so ill that i thought she would fall but the next minute i saw her straighten herself and putting her arm over the cradle as if to protect it she said quietly and distinctly yana i hope you will live to carry better news when yana passed me on her way out of the house i thought her face looked more yellow than usual and her black large teeth further apart after the woman was gone mother put on a cheerful face and busied herself laying the cloth and setting food on the table and grandmother put on her best apron father's last gift and sat down near the table with her hands folded in her lap waiting we children stood at the window looking out soon we saw father open our gate he was closely followed by yonko the sheriff in his grey fur cap which he wore summer and winter and grey coat tied with a red girdle father was limping and when he came near i saw how greatly he had changed his face was thin and weather-beaten and his eyes had sunk deep into his head at sight of us near the window his lips twitched but the next moment we saw his own old smile light up his whole face our greeting and our conversation were quiet and restrained when father sat down at the table he said that he was very hungry but after taking a few mouthfuls he fell asleep the peasant who sat near the stove resting his elbows on his knees and turning his cap between his hands rose and wanted to wake father oh let him sleep a little while mother entreated impossible said yonko the roads are bad and we have to be in the next village before night falls well then just let him sleep until i bathe his feet the man consented father's boots were worn and wet through and were hard to get off but he never woke while mother tugged away at them at last they were off and the socks also thank god that his mother is blind she whispered covering her face for a moment 
father's feet were red blistered and swollen as she lifted them into the basin i saw her tears falling into the water when i looked at yonko he turned away quickly and became interested in a crack in the ceiling our parting like our greeting was restrained father embraced grandmother then he smiled a quick farewell from the door and was gone sister and i ran out on the road and stood watching him until he looked a black speck against the white snow then we ran back to the house she to help and i to pray chapter five with the exception of grandmother i was the most pious and the most superstitious member of the family in sickness or trouble while the others turned to do practical things i appealed to god for help so it was on the day when father was led away to the next village knowing that he was to attempt an escape that very night i felt that there was no time to be lost better to concentrate my mind on my prayers i climbed up on the stove and sat down in the darkest corner facing the wall to shut out the children's voices i stuck my fingers into my ears and began to pray but i could not put any heart into it i felt however that if only i could pray with all my heart and soul god would hear me in despair therefore i let my mind dwell on my father again i saw him weather-beaten and careworn limping through the gate again i saw his lips twitch as when he tried to smile to us from the window then i recalled stories of cruelty to those who served in the army i remembered yonko a strong young peasant telling grandfather how he had been treated one day for some slight offence he was struck such a powerful blow on the ear that he fell unconscious father will never survive such a blow thought i once he goes to the army we will never see him again how dark and desolate our home will be with a pang of remorse i recalled how often i had been discontented only a while before i remembered having sulked for hours merely because i had no shoes of my own and had to wear out old ones which were much too large and made an awful clatter as i walked how sinful i had been to be discontented when we were all well and father was with us o oh god if thou wilt spare my father i will never wish for anything again never complain when i rose it was dark the children were all in bed and except for the squeak of the cradle as it swung back and forth all was quiet i knew that it was mother who sat up rocking the cradle i longed to speak to her of the hope i felt but feared in case my feelings were deceiving me after all i think it was the next day that a message came telling us that father had escaped from the constable in the next village that was joy indeed though limited for father was still on russian soil and could be recaptured any minute and so while we were waiting fearing hoping another week or so passed two things i recall distinctly of that time grandmother believing children to be prophets often asked us to predict the future one day she asked my brother a little serious-faced wide-awake boy of six who looked upon himself as one of the future great rabbis tell me my child will father reach america safely yes he said with so much conviction in his voice that her face lit up with hope from that moment she was more cheerful the second thing is that there was an awful storm and the snow lay piled up almost as high as our windows but on friday it cleared the sun came out bright and warm it is a good sign that it cleared in honour of sabbath said grandmother turning her pale thin face hopefully to the window that afternoon we saw the mistress of the inn and post-office walking up to her waist in snow coming toward our house nothing but a letter would bring her here on a day like this mother cried and rushed out of the house when she came back she had a letter but she stood in the middle of the room holding it in her hand as though she feared to open it look said the postmistress pointing to the postmark it was stamped mamel prussia mother ran to grandmother and they embraced and stood so long and so silently with their faces hidden from us that we children were frightened and begged them to speak to us then mother turned and caught us all into her arms with a cry of joy while grandmother raised her tear-stained face to heaven in silent prayer End of chapter five chapter six through nine of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six spring came the snow which lay high all winter began to melt and here and there green spots appeared 
then the dandelions began to show their yellow heads and the storks came flying back to build their nests in the old stump in the cemetery hens followed by groups of black and yellow-headed chicks walked about scratching in the soft warm earth and cackling cheerfully as for us mother and grandmother having lived in fear and anxiety about father for thirteen years and then having come near losing him found it hard to believe at first that he was really beyond the reach of russia but once they realized this fact they were as happy as they had never been before mother who never sang except when rocking baby to sleep and then only hummed sang now as she went about her work and grandmother spoke about america from morning till night having a lively imagination she gave us her ideas of what she thought america was like the kind of people father would be likely to meet how soon he would find work how much he would earn and how soon he would be able to take his family over here she cried a good deal saying if i had been told a year ago that my only son would go away to the other end of the world and that i would continue to live knowing that i would never see him again i would not have believed it possible and yet it has come to pass and i am not only alive but contented that he should be away ah how strange is life and its ways then she would dry her tears and begin to wonder how he would live without her care who would look after his socks and who would cover his feet on cold nights but soon she consoled herself by saying oh but socks are cheap out there as no doubt everything else must be and they say that it is not as cold in america as in russia and we children were as happy as if we had been released from a dark damp prison cell it seemed to us that the lake was never so clear and blue or sparkled so brightly and the birds never sang so gaily before we ran about visiting one familiar place after another unable to stop long anywhere i came to my bush where i hid so often when i wanted to be alone as i stooped and parted the branches so as to hide more comfortably among them i saw a small half-finished bird's nest i picked it up and as i stood looking at it it occurred to me how very near our home came to being broken up so i put the nest back carefully and went away when grandfather came home we were shocked at the change in him his hair and beard gray before had turned white and his eyes they were the trustful eyes of a child had a strange questioning look in them he had become quite deaf but otherwise he was as sprightly as ever now the chief part of the support of the family fell to mother and the rest of us helped grandmother knitted stockings for the women of the village of course the stockings had to be looked over the lost stitches found and mended carefully that was my work grandmother also peeled the potatoes for the house these too i had to go over and cut away the peelings she had left i disliked this work and dropped many a tear on the potatoes then mother would say what crying so much the better we won't need to salt the potatoes and grandfather after bringing the wood building the fire fetching water from the spring would go to the village to see if there were any pots to mend grandfather had clever hands he could do wonders with a penknife and a piece of wood and in mending pots he was a perfect artist and so whenever he walked through the village the women would call him into their homes bless him for the pots he made whole and fill his little bag which he always carried upon his back with potatoes carrots turnips or onions on coming home he would look as happy as if he had a whole fortune in his bag come children and see what i have he would call out while still on the threshold then he would open his bag take out a carrot and holding it up high for our admiration he would say his face beaming is it not a perfect beauty and sweet and juicy just wait till you taste it then he would scrape it divide it among us and sit looking at us while we ate chapter seven after easter there was some pleasant outdoor work grandfather dug up the garden and we planted some vegetables of this work i liked planting potatoes best i enjoyed walking after the plough in the cool moist earth with my bare feet and while doing so it pleased me to imagine that i was yanko the sower i took long even strides and swung my arm back and forth in a circle as i took and dropped the potatoes mother saw me and scolded saying that i dropped them too far apart you are always playing she said your sister almost three years younger is already a little woman look bent almost double under a bag of potatoes sister was coming towards us walking unsteadily under the weight when she reached us mother took the bag and asked is it not too heavy 
the love in her eyes and tenderness in her voice made my heart ache with envy and so as usual i went for consolation to my bush while walking along i determined never to play again but as soon as i sat down the twigs and flowers turned into fanciful girls and boys who adored me i named each one of them and myself i called dina and then we went romping about in the fields i was extremely happy among these imaginary companions but often they were the cause of punishment for like real companions they lured me away from my work in the house to play among these companions there was one who at first was just a name i liked but after a while at the thought of the name i saw a vision of a tall dark handsome youth and as i always wished for a big brother who would take care of me i adopted him so real did this imaginary brother become that when i found myself alone in the dark trembling with fear i would call out oh ephraim where are you then i seemed to hear him say ah you little fraid cat i knew you would want me here take my hand then my two hands would clasp each other and i seemed to feel safer as soon as the warm weather came the women of the village gave all their time and thought to the work in the fields and so now we had no stockings to knit no sewing and no pots for grandfather to mend he would often come home from the village with his little bag empty and sadness in his eyes indeed there were many days when we had not enough even of potatoes but this hardship did not last long soon a letter and money came from father this was the first letter from america father did not tell us much about his life out there he just said that he was boarding with a nice russian jewish family and that he was already working and earning ten dollars a week the rest of the letter was just good cheer and loving messages to each one of us grandmother kept the letter under her pillow and soon the writing was defaced by her tears one day i managed to get hold of it i put it into my pocket slipped out of the house then i took it out and looked at it it seemed to me so wonderful that a letter posted in america found its way into our little village and this is american paper and here is an american stamp and no doubt father touched this very stamp with his fingers when i thought of that he did not seem so far away when winter came mother bought feathers to pick having three daughters she said she needed many pillows for their dowry i liked picking feathers as i liked sewing not so much for itself as because it left my mind free to dream sometimes mother would let sister and myself take our bags of feathers and go to visit our neighbors one whom we enjoyed visiting most was siomka she was a little lonely old widow who lived in a small hut not far away from us during the summer she lived by working in the fields for neighbors and in the winter she spun and wove to get to her living room we had to pass her outhouse this was a large windowless room a place i used to run through when alone with fast beating heart but when sister was with me i was not so afraid though she knew no fear herself she always seemed to understand as soon as we would come to the outhouse door she would slip her little hand which was always warm into mine and say hold on to me then together we would run through often by the time i found the latch i was in a cold perspiration but once within siomka's smoke-covered walls i was happy by means of a log of wood we would climb up on her bed which was just some boards knocked together and covered with a sack of straw and there we would remain all afternoon picking our feathers and watching siomka weave i loved to see the shuttle sliding between the threads and hear the rhythmical sound of the loom often siomka would stop her weaving and stoop down to pat the pink snout of her wee pig at her touch he would blink his tiny eyes wag his little tail and grunt softly the first time we saw the little pig siomka told us that she received him for some spinning she had done and that she was feeding him up for christmas but christmas came and went and we saw the little pig still following siomka about the house or lying curled up at her feet while she spun then she told us that she would surely kill him for easter easter noon while passing siomka's window i saw her eating black bread and potatoes then she came out and sat down on the doorstep and watched with smiling eyes the little pig rolling in the soft mud before the hut chapter eight grandmother had two children besides father both daughters the elder was happily married and lived about two or three days journey from us whether through indifference or because of the distance i do not know but she never came to see her parents or wrote to them 
sometimes a traveller from her part of the country passing through our village would stop at our house and give us her greetings the younger was twenty-one years of age now and was working in mink a large city she left home when she was sixteen and being fond of children she became a nurse girl as grandmother expected her to be a seamstress this choice of occupation caused grandmother as many tears as father's becoming a tailor instead of a rabbi for a nurse girl was thought to be as much below a seamstress as a tailor below a rabbi father had been in america but a short time when grandmother realized that his immigration had lessened aunt masha's prospects of marriage when she came to this conclusion her peace was gone she wept night and day poor masha she moaned what is to become of her her chances had been small enough without a dowry and now burdened with an aged father and a blind helpless mother the best she can expect is a middle-aged widower with half a dozen children mother tried to comfort her by telling her that she would remain in russia as long as grandmother lived so that she would not have to live with masha but this only irritated her you talk like a child she wept you stay here and wait for my death while my son at the other end of the world will be leading a life of loneliness and as for me would i have any peace knowing that i was the cause mother seeing that she could do nothing to comfort her silently awaited results one night i woke hearing a muffled sound of crying i felt for grandmother with whom i slept but she was not beside me frightened i sat up and peered into the darkness the crying came from the foot of the bed and soon i discerned grandmother sitting there with her hands clasped about her knees and her face buried in her lap she sat rocking gently and weeping i called to her in a whisper to come and lie down but she did not answer for a while i sat trembling with cold and fear then i slipped far back under the warm comforter and tried to sleep but the picture of grandmother sitting alone in the dark and cold haunted me and so again i arose creeping over to her quickly i curled up close to her and put my arms around her cold trembling form at first she did not take any notice of me but after a few minutes she lifted her head and unclasping her hands she drew me under her shawl saying as she laid her wet face against mine oh you little mouse how do you creep up to one but you had better go back to your place or you will catch cold when i went back and as grandmother tucked me in i asked her why she cried so never mind you little busybody she said go to sleep but i teased her to tell me and finally she said with a sigh and speaking more to herself than to me it is about masha go to sleep now you will hear all about it to-morrow she sat down on the edge of the bed gently patting my shoulder as she had often done when i was a little girl soon i fell asleep the next day the rings under her eyes were darker and her eyelids were more red and swollen than usual but otherwise she seemed more calm than she had been for a long time after dinner she said to mother hesitating at every word as she spoke you know i decided last night that when you go to america masha should go with you this startled mother so that she almost dropped the baby whom she was swinging on her foot what are you saying masha go to america and you left here alone yes alone she sighed as if i never had any children but so it must be true i have not had a happy life but happy or not i have lived it and now it is almost at an end but masha has just begun to live and in america she will have a better chance for there are fewer women there they say as for me i shall not be without comfort in my last days when i am lonely i shall think of her happily married and surrounded by dear little children like yours and now listen to this plan of course i cannot be left here alone though my needs are few and so before you start for america you will take me to my niece in the city she is a very pious woman and so i am sure she will give me a little space in some corner of her house of course you will pay her for a year of my board and after that perhaps you will send her money but i hope it won't be necessary indeed i feel that i won't trouble this world much longer mother tried to dissuade her from this plan but she turned a deaf ear and insisted that we write to father at once and we did about a month passed before we received an answer the letter was heavier than usual and when we opened it two yellow tickets fell out from among the two closely written sheets what is this 
we all asked at once not money and this writing must be english we handed the tickets to grandmother who held out her hand for them suddenly her hand began to tremble and she said perhaps these are steamer tickets quickly read the letter after the usual greetings father wrote since masha is to come to america she might as well start as soon as she can get ready and rahel had better come with her i am sure she can earn at least three dollars a week with her help i'll be able to bring the rest of the family over much sooner perhaps in a year or so and besides now she can still travel on a half ticket which i am enclosing with the one for masha quite bewildered i looked at mother her lips were opening and closing without making a sound suddenly she caught me into her arms and burst into tears chapter nine for many days mother could not look at the steamer tickets without tears in her eyes and even then though she tried to speak cheerfully about my going to america i noticed that the anxious look which came into her eyes while the letter was being read never left them also i felt her eyes following me about on every step but once only she gave way to her feelings openly one morning while she was fastening the back of my dress i caught a few disconnected words which she uttered low as though she were speaking to herself good heavens child twelve years old care herself then came those inward tearless sobs and i felt her hands tremble on my back but grandmother took the news in a manner that astonished us all when i looked at her over my mother's shoulder after the letter was read i saw her sitting at the table in her usual position her head was bent low and a little to one side and her hands were folded in her lap very quietly she sat not a word not a tear came from her even grandfather who never took any notice of her except to scold looked at her in surprise well bela he said have you wept yourself dry or perhaps you have come to your senses at last and realize how useless tears are remember that you are sending your child away yourself i can always take care of my needs but you will die in the poor house grandfather and grandmother were always quarrelling grandfather claimed that she wept her eyes out and grandmother said that all her troubles came because of his impiety but when i grew older i learned that there was a deeper reason for their quarrels as a rule when grandfather scolded grandmother would retort with great spirit but this time it was as if she did not hear him she called me and dictated a letter to aunt masha to come home at once then she went to her trunk and took out the ball of fine linen thread which she had been saving for years and while starting a pair of stockings for aunt masha i heard her figuring quietly what we would need for the journey how long it would take us to get ready and what day we would start as for me i became suddenly a very important person at home i was looked upon as a guest now mother never pressed me to do any work on the contrary as soon as i would start to do something she would say run out and play you will work hard enough pretty soon neither did i find it necessary to feign illness as i had often done before that i might be fondled and caressed no indeed now mother would often put baby down to take me on her lap and the young women of the village who never took any notice of me before would stop to speak to me one day at sundown i sat on our gate munching a bit of carrot and watching the red sun disappearing gradually behind the tree-tops when i became aware of some one standing in back of me i turned around and saw miriam she was a pretty gypsy-like young woman whose dark eyes always looked moist and a little red as though she had just been crying so you are going to america she said looking at me wistfully you are very fortunate of course you are too young to realize it now but you will later when you grow older and think of this she pointed to siomka's half-tumbled hut and the little pig who stood at the door and squealed to be let in no she continued almost in a whisper your life won't be wasted like here siomka's little pig squealed louder than ever and miriam turned suddenly and went away i sat for a long while wondering what the last word might have been then i jumped down from the gate and ran into the house to look at the steamer tickets perhaps for the tenth time that day i do not know whether i considered myself fortunate in going to america or not but i do remember that when i convinced myself by looking at the tickets often that it was not a dream like many others i had had that i would really start for america in a month or six weeks i felt a great joy of course i was a little ashamed of this joy 
i saw that mother was unhappy and grandmother's sorrow very awful in its calmness was double now for i felt that i was almost as dear to her as aunt masha when a week passed we cleaned the house as thoroughly as if it were for easter in honour of aunt masha's coming during the five years that she had been away she visited us twice the last time had been three years before and so we were all excited and eager to see her as the days passed and the time drew near for her coming grandmother became so impatient and nervous that she would jump at the least outdoor sound asking excitedly what is that i think i hear the rumbling of wheels isn't that some one coming then we would all rush to the door and windows and find that it was only a cart passing on the road or a pig scratching his back against the sharp corner of the house one day we really heard a cart drive up to the door when we ran out we saw a small plump pretty young woman in a brown dress jump lightly to the ground oh grandmother quickly come it is aunt masha in a moment grandmother tumbled out of bed but before she could reach the door she was in aunt masha's arms and for a while there was sobbing in every corner of the room End of chapter nine chapters ten through fourteen of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten we children scarcely knew aunt masha all i remembered of her two visits was that both times she had come to stay a month but went away at the end of a week and that we felt depressed afterwards and grandmother cried for days and days and so it was only now that we began to know her when she had been home a short time we found that she was affectionate but also severe and hot-tempered if we did not obey her promptly she scolded severely or worse still stopped speaking to us aunt masha was also a painfully clean person and spent a great deal of time in washing us brother whose skin was dark often appeared after she was through with him with his neck red and tears in his eyes but the greatest trouble was caused by aunt masha's personal belongings nothing of hers must be touched and as we were very curious about things that came from the city there was a world of trouble one morning i rose earlier than usual all were asleep except mother and grandfather who were out as i passed aunt masha's bed i was attracted by her little shoes which stood close together on the floor beside her bed looking like two soldiers keeping watch they were the smallest things with high tops pointed toes and elastic sides often i had longed to try them on and once i even asked aunt masha if i might but she said no you would burst them now as i stood looking at them and at my own clumsy lace shoes made by our village shoemaker i thought yes they would fit oh how i should like to try them on just for a moment i glanced at aunt masha's face the wrinkle between her eyebrows was there even now and it was saying to me no but the lips which were partly open showing the white strong teeth seemed to smile yes very quietly i tiptoed over to the bed took the shoes and hastened to the bench near the oven my fingers trembled so that i could not open my laces they became knotted and it took me a long time to break them open but at last my shoes were off i remember how rapidly my heart beat when i began to draw one of hers on i thought if it does not go on easily i won't force it but it did and felt comfortable and the elastic fitted snugly around the ankles with a feeling of pleasure i stepped down on the floor to see how much taller i looked with high heels as i stood up i glanced anxiously toward aunt masha's bed what i saw sent the blood rushing to my face she was sitting up in bed looking as though she saw a ghost i suppose you have burst them i told you not to put them on she said and frowned this frown brought back my earliest recollections of her i remembered how i feared it now as i stood looking at her it deepened and deepened until it seemed to darken her whole face and reminded me of an angry cloud quickly i took off her shoes put them near her bed and ran from her as from an approaching storm outside i met mother who saw that something had happened the minute she looked at me when i told her she scolded you should not have tried on the shoes when you were told not to do it now i think you had better go and apologize i had never apologized in my life in the days where i was given the choice between apologizing and a spanking 
i always chose the spanking now when i knew that no spanking was coming i certainly refused to do it but mother coaxed and begged and reasoned you are going out into the wide world alone among strangers don't harden your heart against your only friend oh how i wish you had more sense she turned away and cried like a little child i was miserable the very thought of apologizing made my face burn but here stood my mother crying i won't have any more chances of pleasing her i thought mother i'll apologize but not now i begged she turned to me that is a dear child she said looking brighter but if you do it at all do it now what shall i say i asked oh just say you are sorry you disobeyed we went into the house aunt masha was dressed and stood at the window combing out her beautiful brown hair it fell all about her covering almost half of her small body when she heard the door close she parted her hair in front as if it were a curtain and looked she dropped it quickly when she saw me and went on combing carefully slowly i went over to her aunt masha i said my voice sounded strange to me again she parted her hair and looked at me i thought i saw an expression of triumph in her steel-gray eyes this hurt me and almost before i could think i blurted out angrily aunt masha i'll never never touch anything of yours again as if it were swine aunt masha fairly gasped and mother looked horrified indeed i was horrified myself at what i had done i turned to mother and tried to explain but i could not make her understand me i was not good at explanations when i myself was concerned quite miserable i ran out of the house and wandered about in the fields for the rest of the morning aunt masha did not speak to me for three days during that time when our eyes happened to meet i tried to tell her in a dumb way that i was sorry but she always turned her face away quickly once when we met near the door our shoulders almost touching i saw a smile come quivering to her lips and so i waited hoping she would speak to me but the next moment she frowned it down and passed on as if she did not know me on the fourth day at twilight i came up on her so suddenly while she was outside that she gave a little scream of fright i too was frightened and caught hold of her hand and she let it stay in mine chapter eleven all through the spring while mother grandmother and aunt masha were sewing and knitting stockings for aunt masha and me to take along to america i wandered about in the fields restless and unable to play at anything early while the flowers were still heavy with the morning dew i would take baby who was a little over a year old on my back tie him on to me with a shawl so that i could rest my arms when they grew tired and start out followed by the rest of the children for hours we would wander about like gypsies more often than anywhere we went to the lake where it was very lively at that time of the year as the peasant women were bleaching their linens there sister and brother would go off digging for flag-root and i would put the two little ones on the flat rock near the edge and climbing up beside them we would all sit quietly for the longest while watching listening it was a pleasant spot the clear blue water lay quietly rippling and sparkling in the sun on the edge were the women with red kerchiefs on their heads and beads of many colours round their necks swinging their wooden mallets in unison and the neighbourhood rang with the echoes which seemed to come from the dense mysterious-looking forest across the lake while through the air floated the sweet odour of new wet linen but the time i loved this spot best was late in the afternoon when the light grew soft and the women went away to their homes then came a peculiar hush and yet there seemed to be a thousand voices in the air whispering softly they came from everywhere from the tall stately forest trees across the lake the hazelnut bushes the flags as the wind passed over them and the lake a deeper blue now in the soft light rippled gently as if with laughter sometimes these fairy-like voices would be lost for a moment in the louder sound of a dry twig breaking and falling to the ground the cuckoo of a bird or the splash of a fish i do not know what effect this had on the children it made me unspeakably happy and sad at the same time i remember that i used to want to laugh and cry and sing and dance and very often i did to dance i would clasp hands with the children and we would spin around and around until we fell down breathless and dizzy at twilight we would start for home 
walking very slowly and feeling very sad at the thought of bedtime so the spring passed as the second of june the day for our departure to america drew near i stayed more in the house and followed mother about more closely gradually i became conscious of two things one was the fear of going out into the world just what i feared i did not know and the other was regret i had not realized how dear to me were my people and home until i was about to leave them but the one whom i regretted to leave most was grandmother grandfather was not fond of me and so he cared little about my going away and mother and the children i should see again but that grandmother cared i knew and i also knew and she knew that her i should never see again one day grandmother and i were alone in the house at least i think we were alone for as i look back now i can see no one but the two of us i am standing at the window and she is walking across the room with her slow hesitating step and her hands stretched in front of her for protection coming upon a bench in the middle of the room she sat down heavily saying with a sigh it is strange but the room seems to have grown larger what is that shadow at the window Raoul? come child let me lean on you there your shoulder just fits under my arm do you remember when you first began to lead me about that was when you still called yourself by name when we reached the window she raised her hand shaded her eyes from the strong light and stood quietly for a while looking out then she said this must be a beautiful day for my eyelids are not as heavy when it is clear oh grandmother it is glorious there is not a cloud in the sky and that thing waving in front of the window can you make out what it is i see a black shapeless mass what is it it is the wild apple tree white with blossoms hmm yes she said meditatively it was a day just like this when grandmother she did not answer for a long while and when she spoke at last her voice was low and passionate when god took my sight from me my eyes had never been strong one day in the spring it was beautiful like to-day i was digging in the garden but a little while it seemed to me when i was startled by a crash of thunder so that the very earth under my feet seemed to tremble i looked up the sun was gone and a black angry cloud hung over the house quickly i gathered up the tools and hastened toward home i was but a few steps away when a windstorm came it rocked the trees blew the loosened shingles from the roof and swept the dry sand in a whirl before me at the same moment i felt a stinging pain in my eyes so that i could not see the door in darkness i groped about for a long time till i found it for twenty-four hours i was beside myself with pain at the end of that time it went away as suddenly as it came when your father who was a little boy then untied the kerchief from my eyes i asked him if it were night why mother i heard his frightened voice it is daylight don't you see the sun across your bed then i knew she stood silent and motionless for a while then she said more calmly but i must not sin for if god has taken my sight he has given me dear little grandchildren who have been everything i wanted Ah if i had only been worthy enough to keep them with me here she turned to me suddenly and taking my face between her cold soft hands she said entreatingly rahel promise me that you won't cry when you are starting you hear it is bad luck to cry when one is starting on a journey and i want you to write me whether there are any synagogues in america i promise still holding my face between her hands she bent over it and looked at it intently i saw a strained expression come into her face and the eyes move about restlessly under the heavy red lids as though she were trying to see then came a pitiful moan and tears rolled down her cheeks and fell on mine what happened after this i do not remember until the very minute of starting on the second of june and even then as i look back i can see nothing at first but a thick grey mist but the sounds i recall very distinctly there was aunt masha's voice crying a crack of whip horses hoofs striking against stones then there was a sudden jolt and i felt myself falling backwards and now i remember what i saw too 
when i rose i found myself sitting in a straw-lined wagon with my back to the horse besides me were mother and the baby who were coming to the city with us and aunt masha who was lying with her face hidden in the straw crying aloud i remembered grandmother's warning nothing but bad luck would come to one who is crying while starting on a journey and felt sorry for aunt masha but as we were pulling out through the gate and i saw grandmother looking so lonely and forsaken as she stood leaning against the house and when i saw grandfather and the children who stood at the gate looking after us and crying i could not keep my own tears back though i opened my eyes wide and blinked hard we were still but a short distance from the house when i saw grandmother go in through the open door and close it behind her with unusual quickness as she was passing the window i caught a last glimpse of her white kerchief tied about her head when we turned the corner i could not see grandfather's and the children's faces any more but i still heard their voices carried over by the wind one by one we passed the dear familiar places each one brought back sad and happy recollections as i looked at my favorite bush while we were passing it i saw my little make-believe companions spring up in it one after another and among them i saw the swarthy face of my imaginary brother ephraim i waved my hand to him and then hid my face on mother's shoulder when i looked up again the road was unknown to me chapter twelve we were bound for mink this was a large city about a day and a half hard travelling from our village there mother was to see an agent about smuggling us across the border and buy a few necessary things for our journey as i had been unable to see mother's people before going we went a little out of our way to stop with them for a few hours shortly before sunset we arrived at their home which stood on the outskirts of a small town mother's father had been dead for some years and the mother was living with her four sons who were blacksmiths by trade as we had to pass the shop which was a short distance from the house we stopped there first all four were busy at the forge at the bellows one was swinging the heavy sledge and uncle hyam who was the oldest was shaping a piece of iron on the anvil seeing us he stopped and came to meet us he kissed mother with more than usual tenderness shook hands with aunt masha and looked at me in surprise well well he said how tall you have grown but you are only a featherweight after all he laughed as he raised me lightly on a level with himself he locked up the shop when we all went to the house at the door we met grandmother coming from the barn with a pail of foaming milk which she almost spilt in her surprise at seeing us she was as different from my other grandmother as a person could be she was a strong stocky little woman so industrious and quick that at times it was hard to believe that there was just one of her in telling stories however she was like my other grandmother everything she saw and heard reminded her of a story we started to continue on our journey soon after supper at parting we all cried a good deal and laughed too when i refused to kiss my two younger uncles on the ground that they were boys but said the younger and mischievous one you kissed me two weeks ago when i was at your home then it was different i said i could not explain but perhaps i felt that in parting from my childhood surroundings i parted from childhood too uncle hyam lit the way to the wagon with the lantern he held it up high while mother tucked baby and me into the straw between aunt masha and herself i was very fond of this uncle and as i lay looking at his face with the light shining on it i thought another minute and i won't see him any more perhaps i'll never see him again indistinctly through my tears i saw the driver climb into the wagon and uncle jump on the axle of the wheel he bent over me farewell he said at that moment his voice and face were so much like my mother's that i was struck with terror and could not breathe until i found her hand as we jogged off i heard uncle calling after us don't forget god and it seemed to me that the frogs from the neighboring swamps took up the words and croaked don't forget god don't forget god the road was very uneven and every time the wheels passed over a stone i heard aunt masha's head bump against the wagon mother gave her some more straw to put there but she refused what she said peevishly is this pain or any other pain that i have ever had compared with what my mother suffers to-night and so she let her head bump as if that would give her mother relief for a long time i felt aunt masha's body shaking with sobs 
but by degrees it grew quieter the breathing became regular and she slept then i saw mother who i thought was also asleep sit up she took some straw from her side of the wagon and bending over me towards aunt masha she raised her head gently and spread the straw under it long after mother fell asleep i still lay awake every nerve in my body quivered and my eyes burned as i lay looking up into the starlit sky i lived the day over again the parting from home could there be anything more painful than parting from those dear to you i wondered will this ache in my heart always be there and yet how strange it is but a few hours since i have left grandmother and the children and their faces have already become indistinct as though i had left them a long time ago and so it will be when i part from mother oh i can't bear to think of it suppose something happens now and i could not go to america but had to return home would i be glad glad to go back to four smoked covered walls no i would be disappointed more than that life would hardly be worth living to what other conclusions i came that night i do not remember distinctly but i recall that gradually i became conscious of the sweet moist night air passing over my face and the splendour of the stars and was soothed by their quiet light i slept until baby poked his little nose under my chin to wake me at broad daylight my first thought was i am in mink i had looked forward with pleasure to being there yet all i saw of it was a dingy courtyard a sunless room a drosky and a railroad station the dingy courtyard we passed through when we got out of the wagon and the sunless room was the home of our cousins with whom we stayed as long as we remained in the city these cousins were the children of father's and aunt masha's half-brother who had died several years before aunt masha knew them as well as she knew us and mother knew them too but to me they were strangers when we came into the room i saw a small dark young man with a pale delicate face a square-shouldered boy of about seventeen and a girl of my own age with beautiful brown hair like aunt masha's i remember that i kept in back of mother the thought of being looked at made me feel quite ill during the three days that followed i stayed in the house and took care of baby while mother and aunt masha were doing their errands there was quite some trouble with the agents they found out that we had no local passport and could not get one and so they demanded an unreasonable sum of money which mother finally had to pay and even then it was just as likely as not that we would be caught crossing the boundary and sent back your children had better take along plenty of money the agent said with a smile while he was pocketing the roll of bills for you never can tell how long they might have to wait in hamburg for a steamer mother wept hearing this there was so little left to take along i think it was on the second day that the boy asked aunt masha why don't you take raoul along and show her the city in these shoes aunt masha asked looking at him severely well he said you are going to buy her shoes are you not why not buy them now and let her go along look here aunt masha said with terrible calmness when i ask for your advice you will give it to me until then the boy dropped into a chair as if he were shot then came a peal of laughter he laughed and laughed until his whole body rocked and his small twinkling blue eyes disappeared we all laughed with him and even aunt masha had to frown hard and purse her pretty lips in order not to smile on the third morning aunt masha bought me a very pretty pair of black patent leather slippers with two buttons i remember that after i put them on i sat most of the time i wanted to keep the soles clean and it was only to give the baby pleasure and myself too of hearing them squeak that i walked across the room in the afternoon mother sewed the money that was left into the side lining of my little underwaist no one will suspect it there she said when she was through she spread the waist out on her knee and smoothed out the creases with great tenderness while putting on the waist i noticed that there were many damp spots on it after that there was nothing more to do our new wicker basket was ready and stood corded at the door and there was a small bag of swieback and two new bright tin drinking cups i remember how silently we all sat waiting for five o'clock how white mother's face looked how unnaturally cheerful aunt masha seemed how attentive the boy was to all of us how rapidly my heart beat as if i had been running a long distance a little before the hour my pale-faced cousin came in and it seemed to me that he grew still paler when he looked at us and said the drosky is at the door 
i don't remember how we left the house but when we were in the drosky i saw that i had my tin cup in my hand and aunt masha had the bag of zwieback and the other cup we were driven to the station at a speed that made baby's breath come and go in gasps the platform was crowded here is the train my cousin said hurry mother caught me into her arms with a cry that made me forget everything half unconscious now of what was going on i held her around the neck with all my strength a crowded train i heard hurry and again you will never get a seat now and still later oh i thought you were such a brave girl you will miss the train mile someone pulled my hands apart i was lifted from the back and carried into the train i looked through the window into the crowd for mother just as i caught sight of her face the train began to move i saw her fling out her arms wildly and run alongside of the train for a few steps then her arms dropped limply at her sides and she disappeared in the crowd i stood for a moment swaying back and forth then it grew dark as if night had suddenly come the tin cup fell out of my hand i saw it lying on the floor but indistinctly and the distance between it and me seemed immeasurable and grew with every instant my cup i tried to call and took a step toward it then it disappeared altogether End of chapter 12chapters thirteen and fourteen of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen aunt masha's tear-stained face bending over me anxiously was the first thing i saw when i regained consciousness then i found that i was sitting in someone's lap and in my own there were two small white-gloved hands clasped together surprised i looked over my shoulder and saw under a large black hat a charming girlish face i felt very much embarrassed and tried to stand up at once but she spoke to me in a quiet soothing voice and at the same time she drew me toward her so gently and so gradually that i was scarcely conscious of it until i felt my back resting against her and my head on her shoulder we travelled for about an hour when she stood up she put me on her seat nodded to aunt masha who was also sitting by that time and went to the door when the train stopped she looked at me with a smile blew a kiss from her fingertips and was gone in wonder and regret i sat staring at the door until i heard aunt masha whisper half severely half entreatingly rahel do stop staring so you seem to think you are still in the woods we were in the train two or three days when we made long stops aunt masha used to leave me in the train and go get food and drink i remember the first time she went out i was trembling with fear lest the train should go off before she returned each time she went out i would get as near a window as possible and stand ready to jump out in case the train started i do not remember how or when we left the train or how about twenty-five of us two young men and the rest women and very small children came to be travelling in a large canvas-covered wagon on a country road white with the heat and dust the first thing i recall seeing was one of the young men bent almost double so as not to strike his head against the roof coming toward aunt masha and me who sat in the back he sat down in front of aunt masha and looked at her with a grin which made the tip of his long thin hooked nose and red bristling moustache touch you are a pretty girl he said beginning to twirl his moustache and looking at her through half-closed bloodshot eyes aunt masha blushed painfully and turned her head away oh come look this way he coaxed catching hold of her hands aunt masha grew angry at the same time i saw that she was trying to control herself and take the whole thing as a joke while struggling to free her hands i was furious to see this stranger touch her and look at her which seemed to hurt her more than if she were struck was so awful to me that i could not stand it let go her hand i won't he laughed and made a vulgar remark at which some of the women tittered but others called out oh shame to speak so to a child will you let go her hand i was hardly able to speak now in my anger he glanced at me and i saw that he was amused and as if to carry the fun still further he drew aunt masha's face to his own then i lost my head i jumped up and began to strike at him blindly with both fists he was so taken by surprise that he did not seem to realize at first what was happening to him finally he let her go and jumping up he caught hold of me aunt masha screamed and the women interfered 
he flung me down into the bottom of the wagon and looked around at the women the little fury he gasped who would have expected it of her she looked as quiet as a mouse i was surprised myself at my daring but i was not sorry from that hour there was no peace like a shadow he followed us about on every step he tried to be on friendly terms with aunt masha i saw this and so seldom left her alone he read my mind and hated me toward evening of that day we came to an empty little log house so much like ours at home that i could not restrain a cry of joy at the sight of it the roof however was of shingles instead of straw when it grew quite dark a few wagons drove up to the door of the hut there was a good deal of whispering and disputing about which aunt masha tried to keep me in ignorance her idea was to keep me from knowing everything that was unpleasant but her way of doing it was as unpleasant as anything could have been for it was always rahel go away don't listen but why aunt masha why because i say so so i would walk away and watch intently from a distance i noticed that aunt masha did not want to go into a wagon with small children nor did the other women who had none of their own at last after much talking and swearing on the part of the drivers which i could not help overhearing in spite of masha's precaution we were all placed i was put flat on my face between aunt masha and her friend into one of the wagons spread with ill-smelling hay we were covered up with more of it heads and all then drove off it seemed to me each wagon in a different direction we might have been driving for an hour though it seemed much longer for i could hardly breathe when i heard the driver's hoarse whisper remember people you are not to make a sound nor move a limb for the next half hour soon after this i heard a rough voice in russian who is there it is mushka our driver answered what have you in the wagon the russian demanded oh just some bags of flour mushka answered i felt a heavy hand laid on my back at that moment it dawned on me that we were stealing across the border my heart began to thump so that i was sure he heard it and in my fear i began to pray but i stopped at once at a pinch from aunt masha and a nudge from her friend then i heard the clink of money at last the rough voice called out loudly flower go ahead as we started off again i heard the crying of children in the distance and shooting chapter fourteen one day i don't remember how soon after we crossed the border we arrived in hamburg we stopped in a large red building run in connection with the steamship company we were all shown really driven into a large room where many dirty narrow cots stood along the walls aunt masha shivered as she looked at the one in which we two were to sleep the less we stay in these beds the better she said so although we were dead tired we went to bed quite late but before we were on our cot very long we saw that sleep was out of the question the air in the room was so foul and thick that it felt as if it could be touched from every corner came sounds of groaning and snoring but worst of all were the insects in the cot after battling with these for some time aunt masha sat up i feel i'll go mad she gasped clutching her hair after sitting up a while she remembered seeing a wagon with some hay in it under the shed in the yard and we decided to go there we took our shoes in our hands and slipped out noiselessly it was a dark night and aunt masha was almost as much afraid in the dark as i was with one arm clasped about each other's waist we groped about an endless time until we crossed the yard and found the wagon fortunately no one had thought of sleeping in it aunt masha gave a sigh of relief and satisfaction as she nestled comfortably into the hay soon she was asleep to me sleep did not come so readily my mind always seemed more active when i lay down at night than at any other time and since we had been on the journey i could not sleep because of the new and strange things about me as i lay thinking listening i suddenly caught a whiff of cigarette smoke i sat up quickly and peered into the darkness in the direction where i knew the door was i saw a tiny light my first thought was to wake aunt masha then it occurred to me that it must be some one like ourselves who could not sleep and so came to stay outside but as i sat watching the light i saw that it was coming toward the shed though very slowly nearer and nearer it came and soon i discerned a tall dark form coming along stealthily i recognized the slow cat-like tread it was he with the red eyes and grinning mouth 
i was almost beside myself with fear now that i knew who it was and i pressed closer to aunt masha as he stopped a short distance from the shed and stood listening i coughed to let him know that someone was in the wagon then only it seemed as if he realized that the light from his cigarette could be seen and he put his hand behind him for a minute or so he stood still listening then he went away as stealthily as he came and i saw him crouch down in a corner of the yard i sat wondering whether he knew that it was aunt masha and i that were in the wagon and whether he would come again he did after a good while passed again i coughed to warn him but this time he came right into the shed and craning his neck he tried to see me why don't you lie down and go to sleep he whispered feigning friendly concern now i saw that he knew us i am not sleepy i said loudly but you will fall asleep if you lie down he insisted i noticed that he looked around as if he were uneasy when i spoke loud so i answered still louder i am not going to lie down i am going to sit up all night and if you don't go away at once i'll shout and wake the whole house then he turned quickly and tiptoed away cursing under his breath at first i thought i would let aunt masha sleep a while and then wake her but when some time passed it occurred to me that if i could stay up all night without waking aunt masha no one could ever again call me that hated name frayed cat so i clasped my hands tightly in my lap and sat watching listening at the least sound in the yard i felt my hair rise on my head several times aunt masha moved restlessly in her sleep then i too moved half hoping that she would hear me and wake up but she slept on at one time it grew so dark and so cold that i could not keep my teeth still and it seemed as if the night would never end oh now i must wake her but at the very thought of it i seemed to hear ah you are afraid cat after all and so i pressed my hand over my mouth and waited at last a faint grey light came creeping slowly into the yard with unspeakable joy i watched the house loom out of the darkness but it was only when the smaller objects in the yard took on their natural forms and people began to come and go that i lay down my head scarcely seemed to have touched the hay when i heard aunt masha say teasingly oh you sleepy head the night is never long enough for you why your eyes are actually swollen from too much sleep get up i sat up not knowing at first where i was or what had happened then recollecting my experience of the night i wondered whether i should tell aunt masha or not she had never invited any confidence from me and this particularly seemed hard to tell as i sat hesitating i half saw half felt the red eyes glaring at me from the doorway and so i jumped out of the wagon and ran to get washed our breakfast which was boiled potatoes and slices of white bread was served on long bare tables in a room like the sleeping room no sooner was the food put on the tables than it was gone and some of us were left with empty plates aunt masha and i looked at each other and burst out laughing to see the bread grabbed up and the fingers scorched on the boiled potatoes was ugly and pathetic but also funny to-morrow aunt masha said we too shall have to grab for the money sewed in your waist won't last if we have to buy more than one meal a day for a week but the next day it was almost the same thing going hungry seemed easy in comparison with the shame we felt to put out our hands for the bread while there was such a struggle aunt masha managed to get one slice which she held out to me here eat it when i refused she gave me a look that was as bad as a blow take it at once she said angrily i took it i found it hard to swallow the bread knowing that she was hungry we stayed in hamburg a week every day from ten in the morning until four in the afternoon we stayed in a large bare hall waiting for our names to be called on the left side of the hall there was a heavy door leading into the office where the immigrants were called in one by one i used to sit down on the floor opposite the door and watch the people's faces as they came and went into the office some looked excited and worried when they came out and others looked relieved when our names were called i rose quickly and followed aunt masha the clerk who always came to the door which he opened only a little looked at us and asked our names then he let aunt masha go in and pushing me away roughly without a word he shut the heavy door in my face i stood near by waiting until my feet ached when aunt masha came out at last her face was flushed and there were tears in her eyes 
immediately she went over to her friends she had many friends by that time and began to talk to them excitedly i followed her but she stopped talking when she saw me i understood that i was not to listen and so i went away this went on for almost a week each day her face looked more worried and perplexed one afternoon the door of the office opened wider than usual and a different clerk came out holding a paper in his hand he told us that the english steamer for which we had been waiting was in and then he read the names of those who were to go on it i'll never forget aunt masha's joy when she heard that we were to sail the next day she ran from one to the other of her friends crying and laughing at once the scoundrel she kept on saying he threatened to send us home he said he had the power to send us home then she ran over to me and in her joy almost smothered me in her embrace i don't remember whether it was on this same day or when we were already on the steamer that our clothes were taken away to be steamed as my little underwaist which still had money in it was also taken we spent some anxious hours the money was not touched but when i looked at my pretty little slippers i wept bitter tears they looked old and wrinkled and two of the buttons were off on the following evening we sailed off in a small white boat we all sat on the floor of the deck i dreaded crossing the ocean for i had heard that the water was rough the boat rocked fearfully and there was sickness and even death but when some time passed and i saw how smoothly and steadily the boat went along over quiet water i felt relieved then came something of gladness i sat quietly in back of aunt masha watching the full moon appearing and disappearing behind the clouds and listening to our fellow-travellers their faces so worried and excited for weeks looked peaceful and contented as they sat gazing at the moon and talking quietly and hopefully of the future in the new world how beautiful i thought this is the way the rest of our journey will be for in my ignorance i thought that we should sail all the way across in this little white boat and that the water would always be calm and the wind gentle when i whispered my thought to aunt masha she smiled at me over her shoulder a queer meaning little smile which puzzled me in the morning when we came to an enormous black and white steamer i remembered aunt masha's smile and understood its meaning we were deathly seasick the first three days during that period i was conscious it seems to me only part of the time i remember that once when i opened my eyes i seemed to see the steamer turn to one side and then disappear under water then i heard voices screaming entreating praying i thought we were drowning but i did not care nothing mattered now on the fourth day i became again interested in life i heard aunt masha moaning a long time seemed to have passed since i saw her face i tried to lift my head finding it impossible i lay quietly listening but it hurt me to hear her moaning at last it became so pitiful that i could not stand it i'll die if i don't get a drop of water she moaned just one drop to wet my throat and so as i lay flat on my face i felt about for my tin cup till i found it then i began to slip downward feet first until i reached the berth underneath from there i swung down to the floor as i stood up the boat lunged to one side and i went flying to the door and fell in a heap striking my head against the doorpost i don't know how long i had been lying there when i heard the cabin door open and a man's strong voice call out up on deck i opened my eyes and saw an enormous pair of black boots and the lower part of white trousers the man stooped down looked at me and gently brushed the hair away from my eyes as i was used now to being pushed about and yelled at the kind touch brought tears to my eyes for the first time since i left home i covered my face with my hands and wept heartily for a minute or so he stood looking down at me then he picked up my cup which i had dropped in falling and brought me water i drank some and pointed to aunt masha he handed the cup to a woman who came tumbling out of her berth to go up on deck then picking me up as if i were a little infant he again shouted up on deck and carried me off i had heard that those who were very sick on the steamer and those who died were thrown into the ocean there was no doubt in my mind therefore that that was where i was being carried i clasped my arms tightly about the man's neck i felt sick with fear 
he climbed up a white staircase and propped me up in a corner on the floor then he went away to fetch a rope i thought he returned in a few minutes but instead of a rope there was half an orange in his hand he kneeled down in front of me raised my chin showed me how to open my mouth and squeezed a few drops of juice into it a good-natured smile played about his lips as he watched me swallow three times between his work he went and came with the half orange until it was dry after a while aunt masha came creeping up the steps on all fours hugging our little bag of zwieback from that hour we improved quickly all day we sat or walked about in the sun soon aunt masha's little round nose was covered with freckles and my hair was bleached a half dozen shades sometimes while walking about on deck we passed the man who had fed me with orange juice he always touched his cap and smiled to us a week passed one day it was the first of july aunt masha and i stood in castle garden with fluttering hearts yet patiently we stood scanning the faces of a group of americans divided from us by iron gates my father could never be among those wonderfully dressed people i thought suddenly it seemed to me as if i must shout i caught sight of a familiar smile aunt masha do you see that man in the light tan suit the one who is smiling and waving his hand why you little goose don't you see it's father she gave a laugh and a sob and hid her face in her hands a little while later the three of us stood clinging to one another End of chapter 14 End of part 1part two chapters fifteen through nineteen of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen from castle garden we drove to our new home in a market wagon filled with immigrants bedding father tucked us in among the bundles climbed up beside the driver himself and we rattled off over the cobbled stone pavement with the noon sun beating down on our heads as we drove along i looked about in bewilderment my thoughts were chasing each other i felt a thrill am i really in america at last but the next moment it would be checked and i felt a little disappointed a little homesick father was so changed i hardly expected to find him in his black long-tailed coat in which he left home but of course yet with his same full-grown beard and earlocks now instead i saw a young man with a closely cut beard and no sign of earlocks as i looked at him i could scarcely believe my eyes father had been the most pious jew in our neighbourhood i wondered was it true then as mendel said that in america one at once became a libertine father's face was radiantly happy every now and then he would look over his shoulder and smile but he soon guessed what troubled me for after a while he began to talk in a quiet reassuring manner he told me he would take me to his own shop and teach me part of his own trade he was a men's coat finisher he made me understand that if we worked steadily and lived economically we should soon have money to send for those at home next year at this time he smiled you yourself may be on the way to castle garden to fetch mother and the children so i too smiled at the happy prospect wiped some tears away and resolved to work hard chapter sixteen what i recall after this is an early morning when we were already established in a tiny room with peacock blue walls and a window looking into a grey courtyard there was also a small table a chair and a cot spread with a red comforter we were having breakfast but only aunt masha and i ate father sat opposite us watched us dip our buttered roll into the hot coffee and asked many times is it good his voice was soft with pity and tenderness it is delicious we assured him this was the first time in my life that i tasted coffee and the first time aunt masha and i had enough to eat in a month before leaving for the shop that morning father told me that i should have to stay at home at least a week and feed up he said laughingly that i looked green in more than one sense so we stayed home and though we feared to venture out of the building we did not lack amusement everything was new and interesting to me it was pure pleasure just to stay in our own room and look and examine our new american furniture and try to imagine how mother and the children would be impressed a great part of the time we stayed out on the stoop i was dazed by all there was to see 
i looked with wonder at the tall houses the paved streets the street lamps as i had never seen a large city and only had had a glimpse of a small one i thought these things true only of america one day while aunt masha and i stood out on the stoop we saw a dark little man with a red bandana around his neck and a silver earring in his ear wheeling what appeared to be a queer-looking box and when i saw him stop and make music come out of it and the little girls that followed and others that joined begin swaying to the rhythm their little pigtails flying the little faces alive with enjoyment i stood dumb with wonder at this even aunt masha looked astonished but the next moment she explained knowingly don't you see he goes about playing in the streets that the children may dance that seemed very probable i expected all sorts of wonderful things of america though at home i had also heard things that were sad i had heard one day the mistress of the inn and post office talking of her two sons in america i heard her say that they were machine operators and they had lost their feet at the sewing machine i took it literally as indeed i took everything else so one day when i saw a rather tall boy of about fifteen pass our door on queer little wheels roller skates i could not keep tears out of my eyes i thought that this must be a machine operator who lost his feet at the machine that a boy of that age could go about in open daylight on a plain weekday amusing himself would have never occurred to me one night father came home from work a little earlier than usual and took us to grand street i was dazzled by the lights the display in the jewelry shops and dry goods store windows but nothing surprised me so much as the figures in the hairdresser's window one was a blonde the other a brunette one was in pink the other in blue their hair was beautifully curled and dressed each one with a mirror in one hand and the other held daintily on the back of the hair went slowly turning around and around and smiling into the mirror at first i could not believe that they were not alive until father and aunt masha laughed at me it seemed to me nothing short of a miracle to see how perfect the features were the smile and i thought oh america is truly wonderful people are not shoveling gold in the streets as i had heard but still it is wonderful when i told it to father he laughed wait he said and then he took us to silversmith charlie's saloon and i saw the floor studded with half dollars from mrs felsberg we learned at once the more serious side of life in america mrs felsberg was the woman with whom we were rooming a door from our room opened into her tiny bedroom and then led into the only other room where she sat a great part of the day finishing pants which she brought in big bundles from a shop and rocking the cradle with one foot she always made us draw our chairs quite close to her and she spoke in a whisper scarcely ever lifting her weak peering eyes from her work when she asked us how we liked america and we spoke of it with praise she smiled a queer smile life here is not all that it appears to the greenhorn she said she told us that her husband was a presser on coats and earned twelve dollars when he worked a full week aunt masha thought twelve dollars a good deal again mrs felsberg smiled no doubt it would be she said where you used to live you had your own house and most of the food came from the garden here you will have to pay for everything the rent she sighed for the light for every potato every grain of barley you see these three rooms including yours would they be too much for my family of five we had to admit they would not and even for these she said i have to rent one out perhaps it was due to these talks that i soon noticed how late my father worked when he went away in the morning it was still dark and when he came home at night the lights in the halls were out it was after ten o'clock i thought that if mother and the children were here they could scarcely see him one night when he came home and as he sat at the table eating his rice soup which he and aunt masha had taught me to cook i sat down on the cot and asked timidly knowing that he was impatient of questions father does everybody in america live like this go to work early come home late eat and go to sleep and the next day again work eat and sleep will i have to do that too always father looked thoughtful and ate two or three mouthfuls before he answered no he said smiling you will get married so almost a week passed and though life was so interesting still no matter where i went what i saw mother and home were always present in my mind often in the happiest moments a pain would rise in my throat and my eyes burned with the tears held back at these moments i would manage to be near aunt masha so that i could lean against her touch her dress 
how aunt masha felt i never knew but once father brought each of us a black patent leather belt one day she put hers on and came over to me close your eyes ryle she said and feel the belt on me i did and as i passed my hand around her waist i said this is how grandmother used to see when we put on something new when i opened my eyes i saw that aunt masha's face was wet with tears chapter seventeen i think it was at the end of a week that aunt masha received an offer at her old occupation as children's nurse as it seemed to her a desirable place and as she wished to begin at once to pay off father for her steamer ticket she accepted it so one morning after father left for work a large good-looking woman owner of a delicatessen store came to her all that morning as she went about the room gathering her things and packing them into a bundle she was flushed and excited and avoided meeting my eyes when the bundle was tied and she was ready to leave she came and drew me towards her almost roughly good-bye ryle i felt her whole body shaking with sobs remember she commanded not to go alone any further than the stoop and then she added a little sulkily no doubt you are glad to see me go she took the bundle under her arm and followed the woman and i went out and stood watching her until she disappeared through the long dark narrow hall soon i could hear only the click click of her high slender heels on the wooden floor and on the stone steps from the hall below the click still came up but faintly and i had to bend forward to catch it then i heard the street door slam resound through the building and all was silent chapter eighteen during the first two days that followed i missed aunt masha dreadfully and felt ill with homesickness loneliness and even fear while in my room i tried to find the pleasure and interest of the first days but now the table the cot the chair were merely strange things which seemed to stare at me coldly neither could i stay out on the stoop i tried to do so the first day but felt too timid to go any further than the door there as i stood for a few minutes looking at the people passing back and forth at the houses across the street the feeling came to me suddenly that i was utterly alone there is not a face that i know i thought not a spot that is familiar to me where are father and aunt masha i tried to picture them i saw many streets rows and rows of brick houses crowds of people but i could not see their faces anywhere with a sick feeling of fear i shrank back into the hall father never knew how i was troubled by the time he came home at night i was asleep or pretended to be one day while wandering about through the tenement trying to amuse myself by walking up and down the steps so as not to think of home i reached the top floor and found that there were no more steps to climb but instead i saw an open door which seemed to lead into an open space i stepped over the threshold and stood still i was not sure that this place was safe to walk upon then seeing that it was large square and solid i thought it is a floor built on top of a house i walked to the centre and looked about i saw roofs and sky on all sides on some of the roofs i was surprised to see clothes on ropes fluttering in the wind here and there from buildings standing out among the rest i saw flags waving but what i looked at with joy after a momentary glance at these was the sky it was like finding unexpectedly someone dear from home i sat down on the doorstep in the shade and looked at the sky and thought the sky is the same everywhere there is only one perhaps mother too sister or someone at home is looking at it at this very moment this thought made home seem a little nearer then i remembered grandmother saying when it is day in america it is night in russia oh i thought so they are asleep now in a moment i was far away from cherry street i was in our log house i stopped at mother's bed i looked at the children sleeping at the foot of it i peeped into the cradle i passed close to grandfather's bench near the stove i stopped at grandmother's bed and looked at the empty space which was mine suddenly i became aware of someone standing back of me i looked over my shoulder and saw mrs felsberg with baby in her arms i felt ashamed of my tears and hid my face in my hands she did not say anything but sat down on the step close to me put her arm around me and gently drew me towards her until my face rested in her lap beside the baby's small cheek from that day the baby became a great comfort to me i amused him rocked him and carried him about in my arms when he cried 
often as i walked up and down the floor with him singing him to sleep he sent his little hand out and caressed my face the touch of the tiny fingers on my eyes would make me feel less lonely when saturday came i felt happy because father stayed at home after dinner we went out into the street i walked beside father clasping his hand tightly i looked about and wondered how people could find their way without seeming to think about it all the streets all the houses seemed very much alike father stopped at a fruit stand and told me to choose what i wanted there was nothing strange to me in that at home when we sold fruit as we did sometimes during the summer jewish people came on saturday to eat apples or pears for which they paid the following week so i thought it was the same here i looked and looked at the fruit what shall i take apples oranges plums pears all were arranged in neat pyramids all looked good and very tempting surrounded by fresh green leaves glistening with drops of water i looked at the strange fruits also i saw long finger-like things with smooth yellow skins and grapes which i knew by name only in a glass case on a square of ice there were some slices of watermelon what shall i take i asked turning to father anything you like he smiled encouragingly i decided on a slice of melon i looked up into father's face i felt proud of him that he had credit at so beautiful a fruit stand as i received the melon in my fingers i saw father take his hand out of his pocket and hold out a coin i felt the blood rush to my face i stood staring at him for a moment then i dropped the melon on the pavement and ran before i had taken many steps i realized that i was running away from home and turned back in passing the stand i did not look to see if father was still there but ran on my father has touched coin on the sabbath these words rang in my ears i was almost knocked over by people into whom i ran but i paid no attention others stopped to watch me curiously as i ran by it seemed to me that it was because they knew what i had just seen and i ran on with my cheeks flaming suddenly it seemed to me that i had been running a long while and i felt that i should be near home i stopped and looked about but i could not see the house anywhere i ran further looking about wildly and trying to remember things so as to locate myself suddenly i came upon a dressmaker's sign which i recognized i hurried into my room closed the door carefully and threw myself down on the cot burying my face into the pillow father carries money about with him on the sabbath oh the sin oh poor grandmother i thought how would she feel if she knew brother is only seven years old and already he is so pious that he wishes to remain with a learned jew in russia after mother goes to america that he may become a great rabbi how would he feel how would they all feel then i remembered yana who on hearing that father was in america and feeling that perhaps we were too happy over it came one day to torment grandmother the first thing men do in america she had said is cut their beards and the first thing the women do is leave off their wigs and you she had said turning to me venomously you who will not break a thread on the sabbath now will eat swine in america oh god i thought will it really come to that shall i eat swine after what i had just seen nothing seemed impossible in utter misery i turned and felt about with my burning cheek for a cooler place on the pillow as i did so i remembered that the pillow was one which mother gave me from home i slipped my arms under it and pressing my lips to it i wept no i shall not eat swine indeed i shall not chapter nineteen on the following day father came home at noon and took me along to the shop where he worked we climbed the dark narrow stairs of a tenement house on monroe street and came into a bright room filled with noise i saw about five or six men and a girl the men turned and looked at us when we passed i felt scared and stumbled one man asked in surprise avrom is this your daughter why she is only a little girl my father smiled yes he said but wait till you see her so he placed me on a high stool opposite the girl laid a pile of pocket flaps on the little narrow table between us and showed me how to baste all afternoon i sat on my high stool a little away from the table my knees crossed tailor fashion basting flaps 
as i worked i watched the things which i could see by just raising my eyes a little i saw that the girl who was called atta was very pretty a big man stood at a big table examining brushing and folding coats there was a window over his table through which the sun came streaming in showing millions of specks of dust dancing over the table and circling over his head he often puffed out his cheeks and blew the dust from him with a great gust so that i could feel his breath at our table the machines going at full speed drowned everything in their noise but when they stopped for a moment i caught the clink of a scissors laid hastily on a table a short question and answer exchanged and the pounding of a heavy iron from the back of the room sometimes the machines stopped for a whole minute then the men looked about and talked i was always glad when the machine started off again i felt safer in their noise late in the afternoon a woman came into the shop she sat down next to atta and began to sew on buttons father who sat next to me whispered this is mrs nelson the wife of the big man our boss she is a real american she too was pretty her complexion was fair and delicate like a child's her upper lip was always covered with shining drops of perspiration i could not help looking at it all the time when she had worked a few minutes she asked father in very imperfect yiddish well mr blank have you given your daughter an american name not yet father answered what would you call her her yiddish name is raoul raoul mrs nelson repeated to herself thoughtfully winding the thread around a button let me see the machines were going slowly and the men looked interested the presser called out from the back of the room what is there to think about raoul is rachel i was not surprised at the interest every one showed later i understood the reason the slightest cause for interruption was welcome it broke the monotony of the long day mrs nelson turned to me don't let them call you rachel every loafer who sees a jewish girl shouts rachel after her and on cherry street where you live there are many saloons and many loafers how would you like ruth for a name i said i should like to be called ruth End of chapter 19